Welcome. Uh, Giancarlo Esposito is joining us in studio. Parish is the new series that premieres Sunday, 1015 uh, on AMC and on AMC+. Plus. Welcome, man. How are you? I'm doing great. Excited to be here. Yes, we're excited to have excited you. Excited to talk about this show. Yeah. It's a pretty cool show. Very exciting, very eclectic, very interesting for the every man of our world. Yes. Do you find that uh, uh, people have expectations going in when they see that, that uh, you're playing a character that is, again, finding himself on the other side of the law, that there's there's expectations that people now have for Absolutely. of you? Absolutely. Once yeah. you play a quintessential bad guy who becomes a, iconic, yeah. then people want or expect that. And I like to switch it up with every role I play, so I look to find nuance and uh, in a new character, and this particular one is one that is written in a way uh, and conceived in a way, as I'm an executive producer and um, the co-idealist behind this project, was to make him an everyman. I became interested in the plight of the everyman, and when I say that, I mean working class person mm -hmm. uh, who is not a hero, um, who is not a star, uh, who during the pandemic was crushed. Yeah, I looked around me, you know, and for me, I, I thought, how long can I last? I got four kids, two households, I'm a divorced, a single father of four girls, um, kids in college, and I literally cried, put my hands in my in on my head and cried. Call the accountant, how long can I last? He said, yeah. you know, you could last maybe about eight months, maybe you have a year, maybe less, depending on how you spend. And then wow. I, I, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps and said, what do you do? I thought of Thomas Edison, I thought of Tesla. What did they do when they went bankrupt? Yeah. I've been bankrupt before, didn't want to go back there. So I said, I can't live in fear. And it all came to me. You build. You build. You plan for the future. You plan for when it's over. Just like the actors and writers strike. What was I doing during that time? Hunkering down, working on this project, so that when it ended, I could sell it, and then I could start making it. Right, what do you think about when you play the everyman? Because that's really interesting. Like you don't notice how good somebody is at it until you are pointed out that they're doing it. Like mm. I think Martin Sheen plays an amazing everyman, just like a regular person who can steal a scene because he's just so good. What What do you do to to make make it like a relatable person like that? It's It's in the writing. Uh, this particular guy, um, as I was in this position, maybe in two thousand eight and nine. Um, I had a family living in Connecticut beyond my means. The bank was foreclosing on my house. Um, my marriage was in a shambles. Uh, I had I was working hard, very, very hard, so I felt like I could have been a bricklayer or I could have been a dishwasher, which I've done before. Uh, this character, Gray Parish, is, is, uh, has a black car service. He is an American. He's American-made from New Orleans is where we place the show. And another investigation is how his nemesis in the show, who he eventually goes to work with, uh, who is a bad human being, has gotten all of his uh, his success through ill-gotten means. And and Gracie and Parrish just wants to do everything between the lines and be above board, but he's not making it as an American. And so that's part of the theme of our show, too. You know, we have immigrants who come to this country and they're making it. Uh, through whatever concessions they they gained or gra or been granted. So what what do I do as as a human being? I make that person maybe not college educated, but someone who has mother wit, someone who knows the streets, someone who has good intentions, someone who has always has a moral and uh, integrated or integral um, uh, way of handling himself. So he has a moral turpitude, a moral balance, a moral you know kind of code that he lives by. He's not going to cross that. In our story, this gentleman has lost his son. So he's, you know, deeply depressed and in a traumatic mental state. And all these things crash down on him. And he wants to support his family. That's what really does it. What's your intention? What does the guy want to do? He wants to take care of his kids and his wife. Yeah. And it's a, it's really interesting to me that you were talking about how you found that and, and being in the pandemic and literally thinking about, okay, how do I survive? How do I continue to support my family? Because a minute ago, even you described Gus Fring as iconic. And I think that people, when they start thinking about actors who have played iconic characters, you just go, well, yeah, they're set for life then. You know what I mean? Like, like he, he did Gus Fring? You kidding me? He's good forever. And you're sitting there saying, like, just years later, calling the accountant. The accountant's going maybe eight months. You know, look, the assumption is yeah. that those who are on television and in the movies are rich. Right. And that they'll always be rich. And I think uh, that assumption plays into my visionary focus to straighten out my stinking thinking 
is to attract that I always will be rich. Doesn't mean I have it all now in the pot, but it does mean that there'll always be work that I can that will fulfill the need that I have. So when you think about it, like you, you and I, we've we've never really starved, right? We're still here. We look pretty healthy. And right? I'm fat. <laughs> <laughs> He's eating. He's eating. Yeah, you, yeah. you got something to live off of. You know what I mean? I mean, that's doing fine. You know? I mean, you, you know that in the old days, if you were heavy, rotund, or plump, that yeah. was a sign of affluence. Right. Yeah. I mean, truly. Right. So you know, <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a it's a funny thing that I thought of because I said eight months is more than than the regular guy. Right. Right. And that to me was a blessing. Yes. And when I looked at it as a blessing, I said, so you got eight months to build. You got eight months to figure it out. You got eight months to do whatever you need to do. And I worked on starting a podcast, which is going to get underway soon, on a graphic novel uh, called The Venetian, which just got picked up by Simon & Schuster. So we're writing that in tandem with a script to make a movie at the same time, same platform, you know, two two bangs for your buck. Uh, And I worked to create Parish. So when things are going well... And everything and money's coming in, and we're, because that's the life of an actor, right? Like sometimes things are going well, sometimes things slow down. How do you stop yourself from thinking this is life now? You know, because when you have that when you have that money coming in, you go, oh, this is this is who I am. This is how I'm living, and this is how it's going to be. And then reality can hit you hard. It's it's interesting for me. I have to keep track of reality. It's just like, you know, I go on the street and I can't walk a half a block without. 10 selfies and people knowing who I am. And that can puff you up in your brain. Mm -hmm. But you know who you really are. So you can't live in the illusion of who you really are. Like, I'm a worker bee. Mm -hmm. That's who I am. You know, my father was a working class Italian stagehand. You know, he worked with his hands. I have a lot of that mentality as well. My kids look at me and say, you gave me the work ethic. But it's in the mind. Like, if I walk around and think it's just easy, I know that what I do today determines my tomorrow. Mm Mm-hmm. I, I tell people that when I go to colleges and universities, I lecture, I do speaking engagements because this acting thing, you know, it's a boon, it's good, but there's an other part of me that I want to share that can also bring in some remuneration. But primarily I want to share that. But I realize I've created an engine that can withstand the storm. Like there may be another strike. I, I see strike for an actor. Yeah. You know, so I can't live as a legend in my own mind. Hey, look, I am, I'd love to be, but it's a joke. It's a play of consciousness, right? I mean, for me, I I get it. I I get how people see me. But if I see myself the way they see me all the time, then I'm not living with my feet on the ground. It's very evolved. Uh, Well, yes, it is. And uh, the the, the good thing is the strike didn't affect me very much. I don't get a lot of acting work. So (laughs) they uh, they said there was a strike. I'm like, when? They're like, it happened already. I'm like, oh. Uh, (laughs) um, I've loved you since, uh, I think, 88 was school days. And uh, you did a lot of stuff with Spike Lee. And I always thought he was such an underrated, we were talking before about his camera work, and what do you think that he does that's so innovative that doesn't get recognized? Because I, I think he never got the credit he should have gotten. I think he's a provocative filmmaker who, who has linked up not only his dialogue, uh, but he's linked up and tapped into a feeling, a feeling of discontent, a feeling of disorder, a feeling you know, the, uh, of, of unacceptance from black to white when he started. You started to feel his essence, and he transferred that into a, a certain way of looking at the world that is 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 very Spike-like. He's starting a movie uh, uh, yesterday with Denzel Washington here in this city. That's what awesome. I love about Spike is he's committed to New York. He's committed to Brooklyn. He loves people, and he stayed the same. So I think his the, what he's done in, in, in respect to his camera work and how he has movement in his films is indicative of a New York style that I think you and I recognize. What was a young Spike like? I mean, is it, like you said, has he not changed much at all? He's grown so deeply and become such a magnanimous, loving human being, but not one who's not without power, mm. right? We think when we say those words, like he's gone soft. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we're, we're New Yorkers now, yeah. right? We're, we're, we're a different breed. Yeah. Like I get it, wherever I go in the world, people feel the kind of gravitas that we carry. That's, that doesn't have anything to do with me being an actor. That has something to do with me being a New Yorker. We're certain kind of people. We're direct, we're straightforward, we look you in the eye. You know what I mean? We don't take any BS. And I think uh, Spike has grown up in this environment and it's affected him. A young Spike uh, was really the coach. 
He loves sports. Like, what, who, who doesn't love sports in New York? Yeah, we got our team. Mm-hmm. We're going to fight about it. We're going to agree to disagree. And you're going to go to the Mets game, and I'm going to go to the Yankee game. Yeah. And that's how it is. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, so I think a young Spike was inquisitive and really curious. And, and a more defined Spike is someone who has used all that he's lived to define himself uh, in, in, a, in a more um, clearer way. Was he confident? Because that's always, like, I find that very intriguing, the idea that Spike can do things his own way. But when you go back to when he's, I mean, he's a kid, he's fresh out of college, he's already doing things his own way and working with really seasoned actors. He was always very confident. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, the guy writes his scripts by hand. Right. Right, so he's putting his own his own spirit. I think when you write things by hand, your spirit is going onto the page. He was always confident, and he always felt as if he wanted to do the way the way do it the way he saw it. So when people don't agree with that or don't want to fund that, he just goes somewhere else and finds the funding somewhere else. That's a confident human being. He's not afraid. There's never been any fear about Spike, which is is something that I've really learned from. And it's not a posturing. Or it, it's it's something that's inside of him. It's just something he knows, and I think it's that self validation that we all we all can learn from. That's a hard one, to be self validated to ask for what you want and do it the way you want to do it. Yeah, because if it doesn't work out, then you've really then you have no one to blame but yourself. Right. Well, we're in a culture today, I think, where people don't want to take responsibility. Like you know, like I made a mistake. That's a hard thing to say. Like yeah. we're supposed to do it all right and know everything because we have the phone. We can look up Google and all this. But, you know, sometimes we just don't get it right. And it's that beauty of that imperfection that makes us human. But you sound like me when I got caught cheating. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Get out. <laughs> it was over. Wait, no, honey. No, it's done. No, no, honey, I really... No, no, no. It's, it's over. It's my low self-esteem. Yeah. I'm afraid no one will ever offer again. Yeah. Yeah. This is the human essence. <laughs> when, you, when, you went, uh, when you went broke, what, what like, because I remember 2008 was a tough time and it was terrifying. When you had that happen and there was depression, what was the first thing that made you think, okay, there's a way out? Like, what was the first, was it a project you landed, or what What made you think, like, hey, there's a way the to The first thing to that out? had me think there was a way out was my wife's uh, father, God rest his soul, Pops McManigal, was in insurance. And so I asked her, I started poking around, how much I'm insured for, how much I'm insured for. And then she told me. And, uh, and my way out in my brain was, I, and I said, hey, you know, do you, do you get life insurance to, you know, if you, if someone commits suicide, do they, do they, do they get the bread? And my wife said, well, that's kind of tricky. And I went, well, yeah, man, she had no idea why wow. I was asking her this stuff. Yeah. And uh, then I thought, you know, I, I just started scheming. If I got somebody to knock me off, death through misadventure, they would get the insurance. I had four kids. I wanted them to have a life. Like it was a hard moment in time. I literally thought of self-annihilation so that they could survive. That's how low I was. So that was the first inkling that there was a way out, but I wouldn't be here to, to be a, a, available to it or be a part of it or be there for my kids. Then, you know, I, I started to think that's not viable because the pain I would cause them would be lifelong and lifelong trauma that would just extend the generational trauma which, with which I'm trying to move away from. The, the light at the end of the tunnel was was Breaking Bad. You know, it, that was, I mean, I had a few little things before that to start to recover, but Breaking Bad was the light. And so I, I did a guest spot on that show, and even then, after doing one guest spot, they had me come back for another, they offered me a contract, I said no. Really? Yeah, it empowered me. And the reason I said no was because it ended this, the third season. And they wanted me to sign a contract where I had six months, they would have given me some money, mm-hmm. which would have been great, it would have been a holding fee, but I wouldn't. I, I would have to go to them to say, "Can I do the Disney project? Can I do this? Can I do that?" And I was in fear that they would say no. And I also didn't know what their intention was. And this was the first step to my empowerment, because it wasn't about the money. Yeah, I was broke. I was bankrupt. All these things. It was really about me finding my own strength to know that I could create my own projects. That was the beginning of Parish, to be honest with you. I didn't know it, but the strength to think that okay, I'm going to say no to this. But I said to them, look gracefully. I love this show. Let me know what the storyline might be when you come back in six months. And if you still feel the same and you're in the writer's room and you have something for me, I certainly will consider. And they did come back and I had a contract and I was on the road to finally starting to recover, put some money away. And then, poof, the rise, the Emmy nomination, all these things happened. But that was the beginning of understanding that I had enough confidence in myself and power. I'm confident as a human being. I'm Italian. 
So, you know, I'm bombastic. I'm all those things in Italian are and then couple this dark skin with it you got a volatile combination baby plus new york plus new york (laughs) (laughs) but i felt as if that was the beginning of me going i can conceive a project or adapt a project to some to my needs take it and sell it this you know this parish has been an eight year journey i had it at fx i have a partner in a and e who went all the way with me it's now an amc a dream network to be with uh but we had gone to them earlier many years ago and thumbnail sketch that wasn't really their cup of tea and here we are eight years later they got in the trenches with me and we made this piece but it taught me here's my line in parish i'm tired of being a passenger in my own life take the wheel i took the wheel here we are the show is fantastic i can't wait for you guys to see. i mean it's not only amazing though that you were able to create this show out of that but the fact that you said no to the contract and instead of them going like, okay, well, then we're going to move in a different direction, whatever, they come back to you, and the response is this iconic character arc that is, like, beyond, I think, anything you could have conceived. Absolutely. is amazing, and it's like, oh, sometimes when you say no, the right thing happens. There's a reason I said no. I hadn't talked to Vince Gilligan enough. Mm-hmm. I wanted to know what they wanted, because I didn't want to be a stereotype. Mm-hmm. Break, you know, Breaking Bad wouldn't have been the same without Gustavo Fring, but... Gustavo Fring wouldn't have been the same if I played him like a copy of Tony Soprano. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I, I, I played this guy. I, I talked to, to to Vince, and I said, I don't want to play a stereotype. I want this guy to be a real human being with dark and light. I want you to see, try to see beyond the crack of who he is. Yeah, he was stern. Yeah, he kept it close to the vest. Yeah, he was that guy who you probably looked at and thought he would never do his own dirty work. Until 401, box cutter. <laughs> yeah. And the dude was totally capable. Yeah. Stealth, in fact. Yes. Right? So that's a different guy. And somewhere in episode four, Vince Gilligan's word to me, he said, what an amazing job you've done. All of a sudden, we feel the audience liking Gus. Yeah. Well, there's a discipline to it, too, to the storytelling, because it's like, that's in there, but you didn't pull the trigger until way after. We've gotten to know this character as we think we know him, and then... Boom. Now we're on this other road that you didn't see. We're coming. on this other road. I yeah. mean, I'm in a freaking, you know, I'm in a chicken restaurant with a yellow suit on. I'm a chicken man. Yeah. I'm a chicken man. So yeah. How long is this going to last? With a, with a <laughs> clip on tie, which I used to wear in military school. I'm the chicken man. I'm a chicken man. I could not wait to get into some monochromatic clothes and kick some butt. <laughs> <laughs> I could wait. You know, I mean, when I put a plastic bag over that guy's head, yeah. you know, choked him out. I mean, that's heavy duty stuff. Yeah. Sure. I've paid to have people do that to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so does somebody else. He's not around either. <laughs> I liked him. He was a good guy in the closet with the, oh, sorry. Did I say that? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> what was he doing? <laughs> you, uh, I also, you had such a, like a crazy career. Like, you started Taps, which was a movie that is so underrated historically with, you know, Tom Cruise and, and, and Sean Penn and Timothy Hutton. Uh, did you do any, I don't remember, were you uh, have any scenes with George C. Scott or did you get to interact with him at all? Oh my goodness, I sure did. I have really, I have some major stories about George C. I went to military school for many years and so I knew the rhythm of a military academy and going down to King of Prussia, PA and working at Valley Forge Military Academy was an interesting, uh, interesting adventure. I had met George C. when I was doing a play at the Eurus Theater when I was 13 and he came and put me in a chokehold uh, in the restaurant one night and said, I saw you up there. I saw you. You, you were a fantastic kid. And I could recognize his voice. He said, and he turned around and faced me. And it's George C. Scott, six foot two, you know, 275, big, big guy. Yeah. And he says to me, don't do it. Don't do it. And I was like confused. Unless you really have to. That advice stuck with me my whole life. So years later, I did the changeling. I was an extra Lincoln Center. I walked by him, didn't say a word to him. I was an extra. Walked by, he walked by me, you know, blah, blah, blah. Years after that, he's doing taps, and I get a chance to really talk to him. I mean, what a guy. Guy did three-page speech. Every every time he did it, it was the same. Every time he, on a certain word, touched his lapel, touched his hat on the exact same line, take his jacket off between takes, disappear between the trucks. I followed him one day. Where is he going? What's he doing? Is he drinking? Oh, yeah, he was drinking a little bit. He had rock the sauce a little bit. <laughs> sure. He must be drinking over there between those trucks. Let me follow his ass. So, <laughs> so I follow him. He sits down at a little table. The driver of the truck gets out of the truck. There's a chess set set up. They're in the middle of a game. 
and they're playing, he's playing chess in between. Never saw him look at a page, never referred to a line, knew it by heart, consummate professional, what an incredible actor. So Taps was a special movie for me because I learned from him, and I learned from all, I, I met a bunch of Hollywood actors. That was my entree to, you know, Tim Hutton, friend for life, came to my star ceremony and made a speech for me. Um, Sean Penn, another friend for life. Uh, the Hollywood boys, the Hollywood boys who were the privileged actors, <laughs> right? I'm a New Yorker, me and Evan Handler. Right? We're from New York, and these guys are pulling Hollywood antics, and they did had their way of doing things, and, and it was very different from the way we as New York actors did things, so we went with it. We had a, we had a scene around a table, and we're all sitting around a table, and it's a tense moment. You know, we gotta, we gotta make a decision as cadets, you know, on, on the, in, at Valley Forge. And these guys, I feel a table is rocking. I feel people kicking me, kicking me, kicking me. I'm like, what's going on under the table? They're trying to get your blood up. And, and I looked and I said, hey guys, you know, I don't really need that. <laughs> it's, it's called acting, my boy. I don't, I don't really, <laughs> yeah, you don't, I don't to. really need that. Yeah, <laughs> but good guys, all great movie we made. Isn't that the like there was that that saw that story about uh, Olivier and Dustin Hoffman that everybody thought he was being a dick to him when he said why don't you, like because he had stayed up all night to get into character and Olivier said why, why don't you just try acting? But, <laughs> but he was but he was kidding. But it, people retold it as if he was shitting on him. But he yeah. was just joking with him. But yeah, he just was. Acted. He, you know, Dustin Hoffman's. Uh, I just work with him, and I'm so blessed to have been able to uh, Megalopolis with Francis Ford oh, Coppola yeah I play Mayor Cicero and Dustin is is the political uh, uh, Berman who is the political head of my units so I had a chance to be on set with Dusty and uh, in his 80s uh, still performing beautifully and it was a great opportunity to be able to be around yet another master uh, who you, who I could learn quite a bit from but who you know I don't push up on and so one day I come in because he, you know, he had no clue who I was and, and why should you? And I love that. But he, he kind of liked me. So we had been talking and talking. So I had a week off, came back. I said, where you been? He said, I had a week off too. Guess what I did? I said, what did you do? I saw you. I said, what do you mean? You saw, I saw you. I said, you saw me on what? I turned my TV and there you are. So now I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I was like... Good. That, that makes me happy. Yeah. I've known who you are for a long time. <laughs> it, it's, but isn't it crazy? You ha you have something now that most of them would know. Like, I mean, very few people wouldn't know you from Breaking Bad or something. It's, I mean, it's, iconic it's, is the word. It's not an overstatement by any stretch. It really is. I mean, it's an iconic character, and everybody kind of knows it. And the fact that he didn't know shows you how, like, kind of above everything Dustin Hoffman <laughs> is, true. the fact that he doesn't watch anything. You know, his kids, all of a sudden, he the third time he came, he says, I guess what? I was like, what, you, you saw me again? <laughs> he said, no, but my kids, my kids, when you meet my kids, my kids are huge fans of yours. He's a darling human being. Yeah. I really love him. Uh, you know, my children tell me that uh, I have a great fan base with young people, and it's a really, really cool thing to see them um, get excited because I, their, their friends can relate to me. So it's, you know, I've had a great career, and I, I hope to continue to uh, be able to be relatable. Well, you, 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 we were talking about, you know, it's called acting. You could just act. But the thing about Gus, I think specifically, is that just watching that character, there was this thing that everybody kind of wanted to act like him. Like the, the, the quiet intimidation and the absolute control over everything. Every guy on some level wants to be that guy. Mm. So if it's that appealing to try to be that guy watching... I mean, is that something you can just leave on set and go home, or do you find yourself like, I'm starting to, I'm getting into Gus mode again. I got to get out of that. Oh, my goodness. Great question. I was walking down the street and I, I passed a play Denzel was doing a few years ago. I think, it, yeah, anyway, I forget the title of the play. Kenny Leon was directing, and I walked by. And, you know, African Americans, many of them came to the Breaking Bad world a little bit late. No harm, no foul, but uh, they, they got on the bandwagon. So I'm walking by the theater and they're loading in, and all these, these dudes are like, oh, my God. And, and, oh my God, Gus, Gus, take a picture. And I said, and I said, yeah, John Carlo. Oh yeah, we know, but Gus, Gus, yeah, yeah, yeah John Carlo, yeah, right, but Gus, Gus. And I, I was going to an audition for Far, Far Cry, and I did not want to bring Gus into the Far Cry world. Same guy in a way, controlling the chaos, dictator, different character. But so I, I, I leave these guys after taking selfies, and I walk away, and, and all of a sudden, my body's more erect. And I'm walking down the street. You literally away. just did it with your jacket. I, I yeah. just saw you. And, and I became <laughs> Gus, and I stopped, and I started laughing. And I said, no, shake it off, dude. You're not Gus. They love <laughs> Gus. 
You can get him. You can take him back in a moment, but leave him behind for the moment. Yeah. Let him go. You don't have to be him. Yeah, because you, you, there's, I guess, because you you've had enough of a career where you're not going to be typecast at this point because you played so many different guys. Mm-hmm. But there's so many people that get they just get pegged as one thing early on, and it's just like it's really hard for them to be seen as anything else in their career. A- absolutely, and I think it's up to me as an actor to keep recreating that because for me, after Gustavo. Um, the first question when I walked into that room for Far Cry is, if you want Gus, that, that's not, that's not, I'm not the guy, right? And I said, there, yes, this guy's a dictator, has all these qualities, but I'm not going to recreate Gus in that mode. So it's up to me to be able to, to think in my brain and be able to allow myself to do something else. But that takes creativity and it takes work. And confidence, by the way, to not go, yeah, I'm going to do this thing that actually worked and not use it as like a safety line. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, I, I kind of shun that. I've had a re- the real. I mean, I played some heavies mm-hmm. in the same lane, so to speak. I mean, Moff Gideon, you have something I want. Right. You know, a different guy in that world. Stan Edgar, you know, you mm-hmm. are not a god. You are simply bad product. Like there's a difference in those guys. Stan Edgar is the cool cucumber. Mm-hmm. No one, nothing scares him. Homeland doesn't scare him. Mm-hmm. These superheroes with human emotions who could crispen in, in a second, pff, they're nothing. Right, so he has an intellectual sense about him that understands the human condition. Right, but it's amazing what you just did between those two with your voice, like that you can hear immediately. You said one sentence, and those were two clear-cut different characters. Do you, is that something that you will practice when you figure out, okay, this is how I'm gonna play this character? Do you start figuring out how he sounds? Do you start talking like him, or does that come naturally to you? No, I, I start with a whisper. I first allow the words on the page to inspire me. Because that allows me to hear, and I read it over and over and over again, and the rhythmic in, in, intonation of the words on the page, if I can say it that way, what, what, how that sounds to my ear. And then I start to whisper the words and put them together. And in the whisper comes the voice. And then I'll add a little salt and pepper, a little tahine, you know, sure. you know <laughs> as I go to figure out where, where does his tone lie? Is it up here? Is it down here? And then I'll allow that to flow naturally from me. Like I came from musical comedy on Broadway, did thirteen Broadway musicals. So for me, the the music acting is music. Mm-hmm. Was talking to Lawrence Fishburne as a great play downtown. Uh, that's how we do it in the movies, uh, and saw it last night. And and Bradley Cooper was backstage. And we were all just standing around talking after the show. A great one man show play that he wrote, uh, and it, it was a fascinating moment for us all to be together. But it was it, really thinking about how you translate something. It's physical, it's auditory, it, it sounds a certain way, and how you allow that to be to join your natural rhythm. Lawrence does it beautifully in his play. And Do you have a, uh, when you do interviews like this, do you go out going like, okay, I have to be jovial, I have to be more, like I have to, I have to be, you know, more myself so they don't think I'm more this person? Like, is there that much thought put into it, or are you comfortable just... Letting go. I, I, I'm comfortable with letting go because I'm more mature than I used to be. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the first time I sat in this chair was a couple of years ago. And uh, I'm always nervous because I always wonder, are they going to ask intelligent questions? Who am I talking to? My life's been on, you know, speed for the past month in, in, in doing what I'm doing. So when I walk in, I take the temperature of the room. Mm-hmm. I just did the Today Show. Mm-hmm. I walk in, you know, I do this promo as I put the camera on you. But it gives me a chance to be in the room yeah. with everybody else to see what their energy is this day. And I try to keep hold on to what my energy is. So I never used to take my own temperature. I'd wake up and feel, I'm an actor. I come in and be on. That's what I do, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna sense me. Mm-hmm. You're gonna yeah. sense something I'm playing. And, and so I've always loved radio because it's disarming in a way because it's not a big, huge camera in front of your face. Mm-hmm. And because you're able to you have to use your voice to, to, to really get your message out there, and that's all you have. But you can even hear in the voice when someone's posturing, bullshitting. You can hear it. You can feel it. Yeah, you, you sense it almost. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's a weird thing, and you couldn't prove it in court. You, you just feel it. You kind of know, like, that person is, mm-hmm. is bullshitting. Uh, how long did you live with Lawrence Fishburne? We lived in L.A. together for about six months on Vignette Street in downtown L.A. Had to step on a one of those apple boxes, but it was really one of those round things that those guys on the street play, those white buckets. Mm-hmm. 
had to step on that to go into the apartment through a window. <laughs> he, had, he had said, come live with me. I got this place, going to fix it up. I was like, fix it up? <laughs> <laughs> concrete floors, concrete walls. They were working on the entrance so there was no door. You know, and we had to get in and out through a window. The toilet didn't work. It was a mess. It was, it was just going back a long yeah, time yeah. ago. We're like brothers. We went back so very far. So we lived together for a while in a work search, trying to get work in, in California. And neither of us got that first job we were up for. Uh, he had been working a long time since a kid, and so would I. So we had been lifers. So we, we had a synchronicity and still do. Is, it, is there anything, is there a disappointment when you build characters like you've built? But specifically Gus, and at the end of of his story, he literally is exploded. He blows up. Like there is no, 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 you misunderstood. He didn't really blow up. He can come back next season. There's a finality to the end of Gus on that show. Is there something when you look at that script, do you go, I mean, couldn't he just go to the hospital or something? Does he need to blow up? Do we need to say? Well, you know, in an earlier storyline, we have you know him poisoning Don Eladio, yeah, and uh, you know going into the and, and himself and going in the yeah. bathroom, putting his finger in his throat and throwing up. Uh, you know, so certainly when I when I got the inkling and 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 Vince did speak to me about it, I thought, well, you know, can't he just have that doctor again? <laughs> yeah. you know, can he skin grafts real quick? Play yeah. those skin, do skin yeah. grafts, come back. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a sad moment when you got to leave something behind. And when there's a finality in that death, that you know, you know, you're not moving into the future with this show, right? Uh, so, but it's also very, very freeing. Mm. Kind of surrenders you to know that you know you're going to go on to something else, right? Yeah. And that's kind of a great thing too, because in a way, you know, any character you play uh, is and extends your career, as this one did mine. It's also a ball and chain, because how do I do it this season as good as I did it last season? Is the accent going to be the same? Wow. Is my tone of my voice going to be the same? Is my, my look going to be the same? You know, I better call Saul. You know, I was a little bit heavier. You know, and I justified being heavier weight-wise because he was, it was pre-Breaking Bad. Sure, yeah. So he was, he had less stress. He, you know, he was a different guy. But the truth was I broke my ankle skiing and I had a plate and 23 screws in my ankle and I couldn't run like I used to run. And I just, getting a little older, I got a little heavier. Uh -huh. So when I look back at pictures of some pictures, I go, oh, God, no. <laughs> so it's all that, how do I get, get in his greatest moment, in Gustavo's greatest moment, how do I equal that? Yeah. How do I do that? Yeah. And that's a trap. Yeah. So you can't try to match anything you've done before. you got to create it new every day, and that's who I am as an actor. So letting it go, in a way, is like freedom. I have one quick question, too, before you go. Um, is there anything yeah. that you did that you wish you had done better? Huh. That's wow. A good question. Because I mean, I, like I look at back, I, I mean, I despise watching myself, which is great because most people yeah. feel that way about me. But I mean, watching It'd be an easy question for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but is there anything you see go, all like, of the above, <laughs> and not because of anybody else? Like, is there anything you look back at and go, God, I wish I was. I, I, I'm Here's not my happy. answer. All of it. Really? Wow. I, I all of it. You know, I feel like uh, every year that I mature more, I let go of the BS. I'm straighter and to the point. I have a, a, a very clear-cut way of working. I'm not a chatty guy on set. I want to talk about football, baseball, any other crap. We got one day, 14 hours to get these amount of scenes. TV's really fast. Why would I want to be on my phone playing Scrabble in between takes? You know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, what is that? You know, why would I want to indulge my non-attention span? So right. I'm all in because I want to knock it out of the park. You know, so I say all of it jokingly. Um, it, it's often, man, they shoot me and I shoot because they come and ask you for me now because it's such respect. I'm such a star, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, would you like to have your shot, your side shot first, or would you like to go second? <laughs> you know. And so half the time, no matter what side is shot first or second, I want to go back and shoot it again because I feel like, look, listen, time. You guys have been doing this a long time, right? You really relax with each other. You got great energy, right? You look each other in the eye. You talk. You have a lot of people in this room. Time, in a way allows an experience that is visceral, right? You don't have to have the nerves and get it recreated. You don't have to, you know when you're, you know, it's, it just, it blends you into the vibration of what you're doing in a more sublime fashion. And so it takes time to get comfortable in a room or with anybody, on a set, strangers, you know, all that. 
So I say, you know, all of it because that time um, tenderizes the situation. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Well, uh, Parish premieres Sunday, 10, 15 p.m. on AMC and AMC Plus. You can see what John Carlo has been up to. For years now. Yeah, it's great. Cooking, watch the cooking, pilot. building this thing. Cooking really good. is probably the wrong word. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We'll take I'll take it. Yeah, it's very good, man. Great yeah. job. Awesome. Well acted, well written. Really, really nice. I watched, we saw the pilot. It was great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank of you course. for coming by, man. Thank you.